Hey Grinder School, this is Code Red Rules. Welcome back. This is Lesson 6 of Poker 201. And today we're going to be going over how to play your draws post-flop. Before we do that, let's go ahead and get on to last week's homework. And we had two homework problems last week. The first one, we wanted to go over... I wanted you guys to really realize which boards were better to continuation bet given that we had the exact same hand and our opponent had the exact same range. So the question was, we raise under the gun with pocket twos. We have an opponent in the cutoff who calls us, and he was a tight aggressive opponent. And his range is almost exclusively here, twos are better and ace queen are better. Which of these flops is our opponent most likely to fold to a continuation bet if you never fold a four out draw or better? And what's the EV of each C bet? Now, the reason why I have these questions here separate is because they actually have different answers. And just because he's going to be folding more of one board to a C bet doesn't mean it's the best board to continuation bet of the two. And I'll show you what, that I mean by, what I mean by that in a minute. So with our hand being pocket twos, on the 6-5-3 rainbow board, the total combination their opponent can have pre-flop is 96. And if you guys need some help going over this, go ahead and post it in either the previous lecture or this lecture. I don't believe anybody did the homework this week before doing this video. Uh, not that I, you know, I'm not forcing you guys to do it. It's for your benefit. But this is what I came up with. And I've gotten a fold percentage of around 33% if our opponent's folding ace-queen or ace-king only. Now, on the Queen Jack 10 rainbow board, our opponent will be folding roughly 40.2% of the time. So he's folding about 7% more hands on the higher board than, say, the, the lower board. But does that mean that it's the better board continuation bet when in this scenario? Well, I went through and I did the EV of each continuation bet, and... The couple of things here, I, I, only, I didn't put on all the information that we need, only the ones that were necessary here, and I went ahead and just plugged in the rest. I'm assuming, by the way, that we're continuation betting five big blinds into the seven and a half big blind pot. Now, it's seven and a half big blinds this time because we raised another gun 3x, got called, and then caught off, and that's another 3x, plus half of one in the small blind, plus one in the big blind. So that's where that seven and a half comes from. And Usually in that large of a pot, I'm going to be betting five big blinds into that. Now you guys can redo this math with four big blinds and see what you guys want to do with that. And if you guys make it four big blinds and assuming the same fold equity, then you're probably going to have a slightly higher EV than what I have right here. So run through the math. The equity when called, uh, what the, the range you use for his range here is twos or better. Uh, and then we put in our to use, of course, on the rainbow board, and we come up with 19.44%. And we just plug it in the rest of the way down, and we end up having an EV overall of around 1.404 big blinds on a continuation bet of 5, which actually isn't all that bad. That's a, that's a pretty decent spot to do it, and you're going to find out the reason why we have that EV is because of the equity that we have when we're called. Because in this next hand, there's not a whole lot changed, right? The amount of lose stays the same, the pot stays the same, the amount of win stays the same. The equity when call changes here goes way down, reduces by a, by a third, or to a third, rather, to six and a quarter percentage point from 19. And our full percentage goes up seven percentage points, right? So, you know, which do you think is going to be better here? Well, after running doing the math on this one, you find that the EV is actually less uh, on this hand, even though we get more full percentage than on the hand before it, and it's less. You know, I mean, it's over half the amount of the amount of EV. And so, in this situation, the equity when called is the most important factor when determining the EV of a continuation bet. And it's keeping the pot the same, and given that the full percentage hasn't changed nearly that often. In this instance, even if, let's just say, we added another 10% fold percentage here, so our opponent would have to fold roughly 55% of the time with this equity in the hand 
to equal the same number of, of big blinds in the in the hand. So it and probably, probably a little less than that because I'm just doing it off the top of my head. Maybe around 50 percent. So 10 percent more hands to be folding in order for our EV to be EV to be the same. So that's that's kind of interesting just to notice that. So keep in mind, guys, the equity when called with the pot being the same given the same fold percentages or very similar fold percentages you know, I mean equity and called is a very big factor when determining which boards to see that. Alright so let's go on to homework number two and in this one we have king queen offsuit. Now I've been using the same exact example for a few lectures now or just to make sure we're consistent and also helps me go back and helps you guys go back to the previous hands that we've gone through and you know maybe you guys go back and notice something that you missed the first time. But in this hand, I actually asked you guys the question, is it more beneficial to us if he calls more hands preflop, thereby giving us more equity when we're called? And even though it reduces our fold percentage. So in this instance, would we rather have more equity or would we rather have more fold percentage? And it's kind of a play off what we just did here, because in this hand, we'd rather have more equity than fold percentage. But what about this hand right here? So we changed our opponent's new calling range to ace two suited or better, two's better, and ace ten offsuit or better, or ace ten offsuit plus. So I took this original range combinations from the earlier lectures here, 287, and we already had the 128 combinations from before, and all we had to do is add in these extra ace two suited to ace nine suited combinations, and that equal 160. Our new for, our new full percentage was 44 and a quarter percent. And, and that went down about 11 percentage from the point where it was before. And our, but our equity, when, our equity when called only went up around half a percentage point. So I think it's going to be fairly obvious to tell where this one went, just because our equity when called didn't go up very much at all. We're going to see which one we'd rather have. Now, if you wanted to throw in like you know all of his Broadway cards, I think that would be an interesting homework you guys could have too. And maybe in future future lectures down the road, you know, it's something I might think of doing, or it's just something like this. Try and try to extrapolate which of the uh, equity when called, and you know, how is that going to affect the win rate and stuff? But not win rate, the the full percentage and and the EV of our play. But let's go ahead and do the, run through the EV of this play. We've got our new numbers here, plugging them into the equation. We get, we get the EV of around minus 0.615 big blinds, and that's actually a minus EV play for us, given our opponents calling us this exact hand range, which is, which is kind of interesting, because before it was a plus EV play by around 0.31 big blinds. So we lost almost a full big blind if our opponent decides to call us around 10% more hands, 11% more hands. So that's kind of interesting. And in this scenario, the conclusion I come up with is it was better for our opponent to fold because our additional one percentage wasn't enough to make up for our loss in fold percentage. And with that, we can go on now to lesson six of this lecture, and that is playing draws post flop. I added a couple goals, at least one goal from last week. I've now had the chance to make the lecture, of course, because now I'm talking about it, and I've had to been able to throw in a couple more things and so today I want you guys to learn which draws to bluff and others to pot control. I want you to understand why more outs and more equity means we should be playing smaller pots or trying to play more small, smaller pots. I want you guys to learn how to represent draws when they come in and kind of not necessarily just be like really you know me randomly oh my god the draw comes in, I'm gonna represent it but uh, in correlation with how you're playing your other hands. Okay, I'm gonna say that. So learn how to represent draws when they come in, as they correlate to how you play the the rest of your hand range. Okay. And finally, understand the importance of having a plan post flop. A few vocabulary here. Initiative. I think that's the first time we'll be covering that. Same thing with representation. And if you guys haven't seen double double barrel, triple barrel, or even hand planning before. Now is the time to really learn that and make sure you guys understand those concepts. First, let's go through initiative. And 
how we play our draws is going to depend on who has the initiative in the hand. And essentially, initiative just means, in my opinion, it's the player that is expected to make an act of aggression first. So, a very common example of initiative is you raise preflop, you get called guy from the blinds, he checks to you, you're expected to make a continuation bet there. The check to the bet, the check to the razor kind of mentality. You have initiative in that hand. If you, if you were to bet out on that flop, you maintain that initiative. Once you check, you lose that initiative. If your opponent raised preflop, and he checked, to, and you check to him post flop, he has that initiative. All right. If he raised preflop, you called, and then you let into him. You're changing initiative from him to you. And a lot of the times, what you can determine hand ranges and and reason stuff by the change of initiative in a hand, and that can be accomplished by check raising, by by leading out. And I guess even by just check folding, be change, can change the initiative too. If you if you were the one who had it, and then you wanted to, do, you know, I mean, if you wanted to give up on the hand, you are changing initiative and giving it to your opponent. And for draws, I pretty much broke this down into two different sections. One where we have the initiative, i.e., when we're being the aggressor, and two when we don't have the initiative. I eat when our opponent's the the aggressor, and that's going to be the majority of the draws that we play. One thing I haven't covered is limped pots, where we have draws. Essentially, what's going to happen is the first person to act in a limped pot is going to have initiative, and as that person acts, if that person checks, he's given it up. The next person has it down the line until they finally check to you. You can choose whether or not you want the initiative or you don't want the initiative. And usually with the draws, the person with the initiative is the person who has the upper hand. So first, let's go over when we have the initiative. And most of the time when we have the initiative, it is correct for us to bet and to continue to bet our draws on at least the flop in the turn. And on the flop, we should be see betting pretty much any draw that has four or more outs. And that four outs, right, is gut shot draw. That could be uh, essentially gut, gut shot draw and over card, uh, maybe two over cards, something like that. It could also maybe even mean bottom pair and an over card, depending on how many opponents are playing in. But essentially, if we feel like we're behind and we have four outs, you should be see betting the flop from the math we did in the last lecture, and the math I'll show you here in a little bit. We can show you this, the EV of a C bet with a four out draw. Also, which actually I can do that right now. So here's the the math of a four out draw when we bet the flop, and as you can see, we only need 30.41 percent fold equity when we only when we have four outs on the flop in order for not fold equity, fold percentage rather when we only have four outs on the flop in order for our play to be break even. That's not a whole lot of that's not a whole lot of folds that we need to have happen in order for our play to be correct. So in a vacuum, if our play is going to be plus E V, we should probably be making that continuation bet. Now on the turn, we're going to continue betting pretty much any draw with eight plus outs. And I'll be going over the math here so when we have nine out draws, our fold percentage is 20.7%. And it actually goes up around three percentage points. Now, as you can see, I only used one percentage of 18% for the nine out draw. I was using the rule of two instead of the rule of four. The rule of four would have dictated that I use 35%. But you know what? I want to do this in a vacuum. I want to make sure that the play on this street is going to be plus EV without having to worry about the next street. As I didn't count implied odds in this, if you count implied odds in the fact that I'm a nine out draw and the four out draw, and give that option, okay, if we get called, we get we get this guy stacked, then it's going to be less than this. 
but I'm trying to be conservative here, so I used the very small one percentage. I used very low implied odds. In fact, I used zero implied odds when we hit our hand, which is definitely never correct, but that's fine. I wanted to be conservative, and so that's why this on the flop we have a 17.6%. It goes up slightly here on the turn. Sorry. What happened there? There's the turn, but 20.7%. That went all over the place. Okay. The reason why is because up is up. <laughs> so, I guess before, when we have the initiative, we should be betting the flop with four plus outs. And if we plan on betting the turn again, if we're called, then we should be betting smaller. So, if we had eight outs on the flop, then we want to bet four big blinds into seven big blind pot. However, if we had four to seven outs on the flop, then we would bet five into seven. Now, the reason why this is is because we're going to be planning on betting nearly every turn with these eight outs. And so the pot would then be, instead of, uh, if we bet five into seven, the pot would be 17, right? And two barreling into 17 big blind pot would probably be around 12 big blinds. However, with betting four into seven, the pot would only be 15 big blinds. And we can get away with a 10 big blind turn bet, and thereby saving us three big blinds overall in the play by betting smaller. The goal, by the way, guys, isn't to build the pot when we have a draw. It's to maximize fold equity until we hit that draw, and then once we hit the draw, it's to build the pot. There are a couple exceptions to this bet sizing. One of them is in a multi-way pot. We want to make sure we bet pretty large as we're not going to be two barreling very often. And that is because when we're in position or we're taking free cards, when we are called by more than one guy, just because our fold percentage goes down, it's unlikely that it's it's likely that one person, if not both of them, have a real good hand that we're pretty much throwing money at. Right? The whole point of continuation betting the flop guys when we're multi way is to take the pot down at that point. Um, the fact that yeah, okay, if we get called by more than one guy, it's not a bad thing because we have a lot of equity in the hand. But we don't have that much equity anymore on the turn when we're called and we miss, so we have to take the free card. Let me just make sure I'm not missing anything here on the hand before that one. The one thing I wanted to say is that on the river, we're going to be checking behind majority of boards depending on the board and the opponent. But I'll go into that slightly more here in the future. On the turn, if we have eight outs, or if we have improved to eight outs, we should continue to bet. An example where we have eight outs, let's say we flopped open in this right draw, or I'm sorry, we, we flopped a gut shot draw, and we turn the double gut shot draw. It's very, very standard. We should be betting that eight outs. We won't, the reason why I say we bet eight outs is because we have enough equity. As you can see, on the turn, you need roughly 20.7%, probably a little higher than that with eight outs. So let's just say like 22%, 23% fold equity, um, fold percentage rather, on the turn when we're making the call, or when we're making that bet. So it's pretty big. I mean, the difference between 20.7 and 33.3 isn't that much. So I mean, theoretically, you could be barreling a lot of your gut shot draws against somebody who floats a lot on the flop. But we're not going to be assuming that. I mean, there, there's a point in the point in time where we can be assuming that's going to happen. But at this time, I'm not going to be too worried about that. I'm just going to have you guys go ahead and check your four out draws. And actually, we're going to be checking our every, every draw that we have that isn't eight outs or more. We'll be checking. So, if our opponent is not likely to fold, though, then we're going to want to take a free card. And an example of that would be like. If we're playing against a pretty big calling station, we don't want to be just keep pumping the pot of money when we're not going to be getting any folds. Exception might be if we had actually had like 16 outs if we had the open and straight flush draw. We would probably just go ahead and bet the turn, just to bet the turn, as we'll get folds some percentage of the time. And two, when we do hit, the pot will be big enough that we can get almost our entire stack in on the river. Uh, which makes up for the fact that we're putting our money in as a slight disadvantage. All right. Uh, one reason to not to take the free card in position is the scare card. And that this is included, guys, by the way, when we have seven outs or less. If we bet the flop, we have a gut shot, a couple over cards, and the ace hits, 
All right, we've got to keep betting that ace, even if we don't aim, especially if we don't hit it. We gotta keep betting the king. We gotta keep betting the queen, just because it's a scare card, and people like to love to put you put you on ace king or like you know king queen, and it's really easy for him just to say, well, you know what I mean. If he did have two over cards, chances are he now hit that, and he's now valley betting me. And the thing is, that it protects the chance the times that you actually do value bet the turn when you do hit that over card. So that's nice, and. I would definitely bet the 12 out draws even against somebody who isn't likely to fold. I think I said 16. I think 12's, 12 and 14 are good ones too. A great thing about a 12 out draw is that we can actually call a check raise majority of the time. Depending on the chip stack size, right? With 100 big blind stacks, the pod and applied odds should be there. Because let's just say so many check raises you pot on the turn. Well, the definition of the pot of a check raise is that it's raising. He's raising in size of the pot, so therefore you're getting two to one odds, pot odds to make the call. With a 12 out draw, you have 25 percent equity. You only need three to one. So as long as he's got the difference between your calling and hit, uh, I'm sorry, the difference between your raise or your bet and his raise, uh, which is roughly one. You know, I mean the month that you're calling, as long as there's one of those left behind in his chip stack, you can make the call be a break even call. And if it's if he's not giving you those odds, therefore he's check raising really large, uh, a large percentage of his stack size that it's not a plus EV for us to call it, then he's probably not gonna be bluffing there. And we don't have to be worrying about too many. He's probably got the nuts. And the thing is you can't be afraid of running into the nuts when you have the draw because you know what if he has the nuts and you have you know I mean a 12 out draw well his hand beats you you can't be disappointed by that yeah it would be nice for you to take a free card and hopefully you can hit it but you gotta realize though that the full equity that you gain full percentage rather that you gain by betting out the that extra bet alright combined with your implied odds combined with the fact that you can still call the check raise most of the time makes it more than okay. And in fact, sometimes when I do have a strong combo draw with like 12 outs, and I'm playing against a really tight opponent, I don't mind getting check raised all that often just because I know that he's going to give me the correct price to call the draw out on him. Because they're not really thinking about that. Most of the time when people check raise, they think about just trying, well they probably think about just trying to get your stack in the middle, right? And that's probably not a bad thing to think about. But you can outthink them with the, with your draws and be like, well, I mean, I have 12 outs. You're going to pay me off on the river because you have a set here because what else are you check raising the turn with but a set? And so therefore, I'm going to be trying to smack and crack your set. And there's nothing worse than when you have a set, right? Then when you know an opponent can call correctly against you to stack you, even though you have a set. And that's that's what's very frustrating. This was the math on the turn bet that we already went over. Now, I wanted to go over the initiative play here on the river just slightly. If our opponent's going to call us in the flop on the turn, we really need to reconsider our goal in the hand, or if we can actually get him to fold that river. And usually, in my experience, uh, the flop and the turn bets are going to be the most plus EV. And by the time you get to the river, it, you go from a plus EV bet to a spew pretty quickly. And the thing is, most of the time people have some kind of reads, but you really need to have a nice read in order to make a river play. Just because like, if our flop and turn bets were plus EV in a vacuum, we don't need the river bet to be to be made for it to be plus EV. So therefore, like, it really has to be a plus EV bet for us to be making that play. And sometimes we'll have some reads, right? Timing tells are key. Like if we know our opponent ends the checks or is playing to a different table, and he's sitting there and thinking, 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 you know what I mean? Somebody who thinks a lot and then calls is usually going to be is going to be a lot weaker than say somebody who thinks a lot and then bets. And if a read that he's like he snap called you on the flop and the turn. That on that read, it's probably meant to mean he's probably not going to be folding the river to you either, so I would not be uh, 
continuation betting or three three barreling that street. Now let's just say you know your opponent's hand range pretty well. Say you have a lot of experience with him, maybe you've coached him or he's coached you. And you know your opponent's hand range is gonna fold to three bets, but just not two. I mean at that point you gotta be careful to bet size it correctly on the turn. I mean a lot of it says hand planning, which we'll go over here at the very end of the lecture. And that is you know, making sure not only you have a good example, you know, you have a good plan for what the hand comes out with on the next street, but also uh, the card comes out on the next street, but also the the bet size that goes into that hand and, and it goes into that play. In the end, the board and the opponent, both the combination of the two, they must be there for their, for you to fire the third barrel, whether it's scare cards. Uh, and kind of a tight opponent, somebody who likes to draw a lot and then fold the river. Fact of the matter is, it rarely is there for you to be firing, firing just like all three barrels, especially at this mids or I'm sorry, at the small and micro stakes, where the flop and turn bets are more than okay, just because we have equity. But on the river, we just have no equity in the hand. All right, so we went over the, what happens when we have the initiative, right? And betting and betting and betting. Now, we're going to turn this around, and now we're going to go over the hands where we don't have the initiative. And essentially, so we've called preflop. Our opponent's the one expected to bet. And the thing is, when we don't have the initiative, we can really do anything still, right? We can call, we can raise, we can fold, we can even lead some of the times. Like we can change the initiative. Just because we, you know, when we called preflop doesn't mean we can't not just bet the flop. But there are a few things that we want to avoid, right? Like we don't want to be raising our draw if we're in position, okay? Because position itself is more than enough for just to be calling with pretty much everything that we have. We can bluff the turn or take a free card if we just call. Now the reason why we bluff the turn here when we call rather than than raising is we can see what our opponent does on the next street. There is a significant amount of information that you can gain if our opponent checks the next street as compared to if he bets the next street. Whether that means he's either betting a very strong range or if he's checking a very weak range. Either way, it's information gained that you will use to your advantage whether or not you can bet the turn. And by the way, the play of calling the flop and then bluffing the turn, or checking a free card rather, if checked to on the turn, is known as floating the flop. So if you ever hear anybody think of floating anybody, this is what they're talking about. And the thing is, a lot of times players float the flop with nothing, with just no outs at all. And maybe at best, like, four outs, something like that. Then, you know, without really a plan to have happen the next street. And a lot, and it's, if you, what you do is like, oh man, people are floating me, so I'm going to turn around and start floating them back with complete air. And that's not really how it should be at all. You need to have some outs. Another reason to not raise our draw is because the pot is very small to the effective stack. This goes back to one of the goals that we went over, and that is if the pot is small and we have a draw, we should keep it that way. The implied odds are high. We no need to turn implied odds into pot odds at this point, just because why would we have to? Like If we can draw for cheap, we should definitely just draw for cheap, and then once we hit our hand, bet extremely large to get money in the middle. And another reason we really don't want to be raising our draw is if we have more than eight outs. And that is because we have just too much equity in the hand and we don't want to be bluffing in that situation. You know, I mean, granted we could be bluffing, right? Because we have one equity. I'm not saying a bluff is not going to be plus EV. It would be. But there are other gonna, there are going to be other hands that we should be bluffing with that are that are plus EV and that we can merge our calling range here with with other calling hands that we have. So, like when we do call on the flop, we can have both hands that are drawing, but also hands that are for value. And when we do raise the flop, we can have hands that are drawing, but also we can raise hands that are for value. Consequently, instead of just always raising the flush draws and always calling when we're doing it for value, you're playing a very unbalanced and very predictable style of play. So in this way, we can continue to, you know, we want to see the turn, we want to see the river for cheap, and don't underestimate the implied odds that we get when we do call.
Think of how often you guys pay off the flush, or think of how often you know, I mean, how often anybody pays off the flush. It's, I'm not saying that like you know, I mean, oh my god, nobody ever pays off the flush. But what happens is, you everybody is afraid of being bluffed, and so therefore the more willing to pay off, and at that same time it allows us to be able to draw to the flush, and therefore get paid off. So, when we don't have posi position. I'm sorry, when we don't have initiative, there are two different ways of playing, and that is in position and out of position. The thing is, when we had the initiative, position matters somewhat, uh, but our decisions were, were whether to bet or to check most of the time. When we don't have initiative, we can do anything from betting, calling, check raising, we can do anything, right? So we have much more options re that are realistic when we don't have, when we don't have initiative and we're out of position compared to in position. So let's go over in position here first. And as a review, right, so position allows us to take free cards. And that entirely of itself is just purpose for calling the flop, right? Just a chance of being able to see the free card. We can also bluff when checked to and you know we get to see how how, how strong our opponent's hand is before we act. So Let's say we call the flop right, and he checks to us on the turn, we check behind, he checks again on the river. He's checked two streets, he's not going to have the nuts. So just by knowing that, we can we can play our hand accordingly. When we have eight outs, guys, and we're in position, we're going to usually be calling both the flop and the turn bet. And against somebody who's going to be double barreling a lot on the turn, we should shove the turn rather than trying to call the flop and call the turn because no, there's nothing worse than like calling a flop bet and calling a turn bet with like a, with a flush draw and then realizing on the river your opponent was bluffing but he still beat your hand like that that is like the worst thing it's because you were drawing to this draw that you didn't have applied odds for and you still won it even though you missed it and you didn't have anything um, we have, if we have somebody who likes to barrel a lot so barreling is seeming both the flop and the turn and perhaps even the river with a high frequency. And the stats, I don't know, you can get the stat on your HUD or on your pop-up or however you want to have it, but somebody who barrels a lot, we should just be jamming the turn all in rather than raising the flop. And I did some math on this. I'll show you guys here on the next slide. The break-even full percentage on this play is going to be around 69.9%. Now that might look to be pretty high, but think about it this way. Somebody who's raising up 30% of hands pre-flop and continuation betting 70% of the time and then double barreling over half the time of that, they still have 11% of their overall hands in their hand range. All right. Now, how often do, are you guys ever calling a turn all in with for your stack? Okay, you doing it with top pair? you doing it with an over pair? You doing it when you're doing it against another reg? I mean, what even about like bottom two pair? I mean, what hands are you getting? Are you st willing to stack off with post flop, facing a turn all in? It's just a matter of the fact that like people don't really raise enough on the turn to merit stacking off that much later. So with this, by shoving in the turn, all right, we can balance our return shoves when we have the nut hands. A lot of the time, you guys love to go all in on the turn or raise the turn with the nuts, but yet, when are you ever doing it? without the nuts and and the answer there is usually never but and so we'll go back to the, the previous idea when we're in position when we've got two or less outs we're going to be calling if we had like second or third pair here uh, I'm that's not technically the same part of the conversation but I did want to mention it uh, we're probably going to be folding we might be calling middle pair and certainly, we're going to be folding you more often on the flop if our opponent's going to be barreling a lot. We can't, we don't really have the same defensive maneuvers by raising our opponent when we have no equity. But the fun part is when we have three to seven outs, uh, we can do pretty much anything depending on our opponent and the board or how many outs that we have. We can call, raise, or fold. If our opponent double barrels, triple barrels, then be more willing to raise the flop with three to seven outs rather than the turn. It's going to be cheaper, guys, than calling the flop and trying to float the turn. And we're not going to gain any information at all by him barreling and all, barreling us off our draw. I find this works best, guys, with um, 
overcard and some kind of backdoor draws. And that allows us to actually, you know, if we are called, we have a reasonable chance of winning the hand. Say something like if we had the backdoor flush draw, like, and we raise the turn and he calls us, and we turn the draw, well, we can check behind and have a decent amount of time of, be decent chance of, like, winning the hand and maybe even getting, you know, a de an extra value bet off on the river there because of that. Essentially, when we do bluff raise the flop, though, in our position, we're going to be checking pretty much everything on the uh, on the turn, even like our eight out draws and stuff. Because at that point, the pot's getting pretty large, and a free card there for us is going to be real beneficial. Now, against an opponent who fires just one barrel, uh, I call him a one and dunner, uh, then gives up on the turn. Be more willing to just call the flop and then bluff the turn when we're checked to. Again, we're going that's pretty much the same thing as a float, right? Where we call the flop and then bet the turn when checked to. When we're playing against an opponent, we're gonna be calling probably with around six or seven outs. So that's two over cards and a gut shot along those lines. But we're gonna be folding if we got any less than that. You know, against an unknown guy, we really don't know how to react and it's just gonna be a kind of spewy if we try and make a bluffy play against him. So math on the turn shove. Now, when we are out of position and we don't have the initiative, the plays are actually very similar. We, we, we can decide whether or not we want to give up the initiative or continue him having the initiative or taking it back from us. And the main difference is we're going to be calling the flop a lot less, though, and then betting the turn more in all cases. So when we have eight outs or more or two outs or less, the play is going to be same as the slide two slides ago right here. Call both flop and turn with eight plus outs. Probably fold the flop or definitely fold the turn if you get two less two outs or less. And again the three to seven outs are the tricky the tricky outs here. And we have three options that I want you guys all to think to realize and that they are all options and we should all be doing a certain percentage of these based on the board texture, frequencies, what hand that we have, the opponent we're playing against. And when we were in position, okay, and we had to, we didn't have the initiative, the times that we would raise that flop we're not leading out on. Okay, let's say we have over cards and a backdoor flush draw which could be anywhere between four outs and seven outs, I guess. We can lead the flop, and then we can also pick up eight more outs when we bet the turn. So we're, when we bet the turn again, when we pick up eight more outs. So therefore, yeah, we just randomly lead the flop with two over cards. And, you know, if we get called, okay, if when we flop top pair, it's probably going to be good. And when we pick up the flush draw, we can bet again. And it's a good way for us to balance then our flop leading range when we do have strong hands too. So it's not very, it, it allows us to maintain some balance, allows us to play a little bit more unexploitable, even though in this instance, most likely we're not doing it with enough frequency that uh, it's going to be different than say our value range. And who's to say that we're not leading more than our value range is, but it's better they have at least some bluffs in every single line that you could possibly have, and that's definitely an example of that. And let's say we have between five and seven outs, and the over cards and gut shots are good for this, as well as let's say we have like bottom pair or something like that, and that that will work out too. Let's say we can't really call in that situation, we can check raise the bottom pair and, a, and an over card. We can balance our flop check raising range when we have strong hands by check raising the flop with five to seven outs and we can improve the turn again if we were to if we increase our outs so let's say we picked up just like the previous example i gave you where we were aggressive with the gut shot draw and picked up the open into straight draw and then x straight or double gutter rather well we can if we pick up that draw we can bet the turn again and essentially if we hit a pair on the next street, then we're going to be check calling because we now have a pair and a draw. And 
There's a chance we might still be ahead if our opponent has a worse draw. And when we're out of position, guys, when we have three to four outs, it's not r really all that easy. Not that difficult, rather. We're just going to be folding because there's not really a whole lot we can do. There's really no way we can outplay our opponent that way. Here is the math, guys, on the, the flop check raise, the break even fold percentage. This is assuming that our opponent's continuation betting to 4x, and we're check raising him to 12. And that's around 44% of the time. And that's really great against somebody who's just continuation betting just way too much on on board to shooting check raise or continuation betting on and doing it with a wide range. So it's a good defense against that maneuver. Now, one caveat to everything that I've said before this is how re-raised pots can change everything. So let's say we called re-raise preflop, or we did re-raise preflop, and we get called. The pot and stack size, or stack to pot ratio, rather, I guess is where, what I'm trying to say, has a lot to do with how we play the hand. Uh, we can, with eight outs, right, and we called a re-raise, let's say we picked up an open end straight trail, or even a flush draw, we can no longer call the flop and turn bets in order to see a river profitably at this point. The pot would be just be too big. We can maybe call the flop, yeah, but the turn, we're not going to have the implied odds. And so therefore, we're going to have to fold the turn a lot. We should just be going all in when that situation arises. All right, we're going to have some fold equity. Our opponent will be folding some worse hands, maybe not a whole lot. And the fact of the matter is, by the time he bets out the flop, there's going to be so much money in the pot anyway that we really don't have to worry about it too much. Just go ahead and get it all in. And the same thing goes if we re-raised pre-flop. We flop the open and strike draw. We bet it out. We get raised. Okay. We should just be getting it all in there too. And if we do get called on the flop, then most likely we're going to have to be getting, we're going to be getting it all in on the next street or check folding. There's no, like, bet half stack and then call the rest of it off. Don't do anything like that. Either jam it all in or check fold it. And with four to seven outs in a re-raised pot, let's just say you're trying to be funny and you call the suit connector or something like that. When we're out of position, we should just be folding. When we're in position, we... You should probably call one street, take a free card with the rest. And this is more or less something with if you have like a straight draw. When we're when we are how would you say calling re raises pre flop. So like if we call re raise King Queen offsuit pre flop We like I don't want you guys calling with like backdoor club draws on two tone board with King Queen over card. I mean this isn't limit hold them. Uh, there, situation like that, I'd probably just have you fold it. But if you had king, if you had like a gut shot draw or something like that, or uh, along those lines, I would have you guys. There are two overcards in the gut shot. Definitely not folding them. And if our opponent like checks the turn the river to us, when we're in position. Uh, we can go ahead and bluff the river. And let's say we check all the flop. You know, we're not really giving check calling the flop out of position with four to seven outs. So don't have to worry about that too much. And the thing is, too, like, when we're playing in re-raised pots, the check to pot ratio is nearly identical to when we're only playing in single raised pots. So the strategy is going to be the same here. Whenever we flop a flush draw against a short stack and a 30, when he's got 30 big blinds, we're pretty much resorted to the fact that we're going to have to get it all in at that point. But it's the same. It's the same exact SPR. It's the same exact reasoning behind it. The stack size is just so much shorter compared to the effect of uh, to the money in the pot that we should just be getting it all in. All right. So on this side, I'm gonna go over how to represent some of the draws. And a lot of the times, I hear a lot of people say, oh, "I'm gonna represent the flush draw here by calling." And that's not really how you represent flush draws at all. To represent a flush draw, what you've got to do is be the aggressor on a board that could reasonably be contain a flush draw as a number of your bluffing range. 
is what will happen is your opponent is going to put you on a range of hands, including better value hands than what he's got. He's going to put you on hands that include the flush draws, and he's going to put you on some random air. The thing is, once the flush draw comes in on the next street and you check raise bluffed him with, let's say, the gut shot and two overcards, right? At that point, he's gonna be like, "Well, I mean, most of his draws just got there, so I'm gonna go ahead and be, I'm gonna go ahead and be folding." And that's actually a correct play by him, because most of the, most of your draws did get there. Well, little does he know that that you're very rarely if ever check raising a flush draw, but that doesn't mean he can't put you on it, because so many regulars today are still check raising their flush draws pretty heavily, even though it's incorrect to do so. And th Another thing is, too, we can represent the flush draw after we call the flop bet and our opponent checks to us when a draw comes in. We can try and bluff our opponent there. Some some players it works out. Some players are check calling, even though you really should only be betting that river for value when you have the flush. And so it's a very ex experienced play, trying to bet your opponent off a of hand when you try to represent the flush draw. Uh, you can maybe raise some rivers in that same line too, where it's like, well, you can't really ever call me here with anything but these kind of hands. I'll go that like maybe a setter better, a two pair, and representing the flush draw by raising in that instance. I do that sometimes. And by sometimes, I mean quite a bit, just because it's a lot of fun and it really helps out your image. And finally, guys, I want to talk to you about having a plan in poker. And this is specifically post flop. Let's just say, right, we're on the flop, right? We we continue with Asian bet. We know what our two cards are, we know what three cards are on the board. There are forty seven cards left. Right? That's a finite number. You could theoretically determine which or how to react given what card on the next street at any given time. And it's usually best to group cards based on equity. So we'll group them in terms of ones that improve our equity and ones that don't. And the ones that don't improve our equity, right, when they've improved our fold percentage, then we're, then we're going to be betting. And that essentially means like when a scare card hits. If a scare card hits and our equity doesn't really change anything, then we're going to bet in because we have got better fold percentage. And if it's just kind of, kind of a random hand, it didn't improve, didn't improve equity, it didn't improve our fold percentage, we should just go ahead and be folding it and not even thinking twice about it. But more importantly, the example that I have for you here about a hand planning, this is going to be also over a couple of your homeworks assignment. So keep this, keep this PowerPoint slide handy. We have king, queen of diamonds, right? And the flop is jack of diamonds, eight of clubs, two of spades. We decide to see bet the flop, and we're called. What's our plan going to be for the turn? Well, like I said, there's only 47 possible turn cards. We've already said before that when we pick up nine or eight plus outs, we're going to be betting. So therefore, we're going to be betting any ten or any diamond. That's 13 cards. We're also going to be betting the scare card. That's another three. That's all the aces, and there's a typo there for you. That's not bad so far for this for this example. There's going to be three more cards that have the ace in it. So that's 16 total that we know what we're going to be doing on. All right. Well, there's 47 cards in the deck. 16 we're betting. 31 we're not. All right. We're going to be barreling the turn 34.04 percent of the time. I didn't count the times we flop the we turn the king or the queen. It's going to be another six cards we flop top pair, and it becomes a very easy check call. Okay, um, by the time we've added that, and we have roughly a plan on 45% of the hands on this board. So keep that in mind. That's great. It's it's so much. You guys are going to feel so much more comfortable playing when you have a plan to play. And the thing is, if you're just playing randomly, okay it's so much harder to correct that when you make a mistake because you're just doing a, you're just doing some things randomly in a vacuum whereas if you have a plan and you follow through with that plan all right it's going to be a lot easier for you to fix that plan than say trying to figure out you know I mean a million random errors that would have happened in the same play 
All right, let's go on. Oh, we're right in the lecture here. summary. Hopefully today you guys have learned which draws to bluff and others to pot control. Now pot control, I don't know if I covered it, just simply means not trying to play a big pot and essentially that until we hit our hand rather that's essentially eight or nine out draws. Understand why more out and more equity means we should be playing smaller pots and that's because we want to maintain our implied our applied odds. We want to re learn how to re represent the draws when they come in and we want to understand the importance of having a plan post flop. Our next lesson guys is going to be on three bet pots. We're going to be going over three bet bluffing ranges we're going to be going over what hands to call the three bet with and we're going to understand how to play post flop in three bet pots. So this that should be pretty fun. Before we do that I've got a few homework assignments for you. Uh, not too hard, not too hard. First example, all right, we have queen ten of diamonds on that same flop of deck of diamonds, eight of clubs, two of spades. We decide to see what the flop and we're called. I want you guys to figure out what the plan is for every single turn card or turn grouping. And, and I want you guys to calculate our turn to barreling percentage. It's just a matter of doing that fraction. It's pretty easy. Homework number two, same flop, but we now have nine seven of diamonds over queen ten of diamonds. It should it give you different answers. And then on homework three, on the same flop, Let's say we called a min-raise preflop out of position. Which hands that the, of the four I have listed here would be best to check raise, lead the flop, check call, or check fold, and why? So I'm not saying there's going to be a correct answer here to each one of these, and depending on your reasonings, you know I mean there might be more than one correct answer, but. There also might only be one answer, and if you guys aren't sure what it is, then go ahead and make you know me ask questions and talk amongst yourselves on the on the forum and stuff. And I'll go ahead and give you guys my thought process and the answer in the next lecture. Otherwise, guys, this has been Code Red Rules. Thank you for joining me. I can't wait to see you guys back here next time. And otherwise, good luck at the tables. Bye.